What's up, beautiful Dallas family? Kit Cummings up here outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Very excited to dig in and spend another uh, little bit of time with you. We're uh, in week three on our 40 Days to Prayer journey, and I pray that it's going well for you, you know. Um, but I also know that I, I, I've started a lot of things and gotten pretty fired up and then, you know, kind of dwindles away unless there is a routine, unless there's a little bit of healthy accountability. And um, I'm so grateful to the Asads for inviting me in. And um, so far, I've, I've done a live version with two different groups um, the last couple of weeks. And so I'm getting to bond with you guys. I appreciate you adopting me into the Dallas uh, family. And, um, and just willing to do this. Thank you for, um, the, the leadership sharing the pulpit with me and embracing me. I appreciate it. And I want this to be everything that it needs to be for you. You know, I mean, different uh, people are in different places. I mean, coming out of this crazy 2020 and 2021, um, I know that there's a lot of people that are beat up, good, faithful people that are beat up. I've been beat up too. And so this is perfect. We have a brand new year. Uh, Georgia won the national championship. I know you're excited about that. My, the Braves won the World Series. I know you're fired up about that. Everybody is. Uh, 2022, man, year of miracles. It's already started good down in my part of the world. But um, but anyway, I also know that, you know, some people are struggling. I mean, I've gotten great feedback like, this is awesome, man. It's really been this and that. Um, but I also know some people out there that maybe haven't gotten started yet or started and stumbled, or maybe just, I don't know, never really was like into it, you know? Um, that's okay. There's no judgment. There's no shame in this game. Um, I want it to be a program of attraction, not promotion, you know, that that it's, it's you're hearing a buzz. There's people that are really doing some new things in a new way. It's not the only way to do things. It's just a new way. And it's a way that helped me climb out of the pit and develop not just a relationship with God, but a new love you know, and took me to new places. And, and so I'm sharing it with you. And um, I hope that it's it's doing well. The steps, um, you do anything 40 days in a row and it becomes a habit. I don't care what it is. The brain is paying attention. Remember last week, Uncle G? <laughs> this past week, since I last spoke to you, Uncle G is paying attention to what you're paying attention to. I mean, every move you make, he's paying attention. That's the way God created him to be. He's recording everything. He's replaying old tapes. He's learning new things. He's establishing new habits. And so the habits that that we created in 2020 and 2021, where we were virtual and there wasn't a lot of contact, Uncle G learned, okay? And it's kind of like this. You know, 2013, I started getting, 2012, I started getting on my knees first thing every morning, just rolling out of bed. Well, I had my knee replaced. I had a total knee replacement um, just under three months ago. And so I had been rolling out of my bed onto my knees until this past week. And so already Uncle G has gone back to his old ways. I've been doing this for eight years. And in a short little two-month span, he's like, all right, boss, we're going to go back to the way it used to be. And I'm having to retrain Uncle G. No, you submit. Get on your knees first thing so that I, my first waking thoughts are to him, about him, for him. We're giving him our true first fruits. Um, you know, I hope writing down your prayers has clarified what you're seeking, you know, and that, that it's starting to get into the mind and the heart so that you carry those throughout the day with you so that you begin to see evidence that God is at work. And maybe you've even seen a couple of things that we're going to call miracles and not, I mean, they're not big and little miracles. Miracles means God got involved. It can be the Red Sea, but it can also be, you know, a, you know, I mean, there's a million things it can be that you go out and you pray for signs and look for signs. And all of a sudden God's fingerprints, evidence of his power and glory are all around you. And then we started to write it down, take a measurable step towards your miracle, make that call. You know, make that move, start a new habit, start a new, show God that you're serious about this thing because he loves faith with deeds. Otherwise, it's just religion. And I don't want that. Just, just empty, powerless religion, man. I've had that, you know, I created that in my own life for some time. And so this is a new time. Repent quickly and get back on the beam, man. Don't make it a thing. And basically just try to stay in a state of gratitude. That ain't easy, but it can be a habit. 
Your old habits, we're trying to break the ones that do not serve you. All the ones that do serve you, keep them. I mean, Uncle G's got it on lock. You don't have to worry about it. It's already a habit. But the ones that are not serving you, those are the ones we're trying to dismantle. And just like Jesus said, when you come in and clear a house, when you drive out a demon, make sure and replace, <laughs> you know, the, the, that space. Or he'll go out and get seven buddies and come back and the, the it'll be worse in the end than it was in the beginning. And so when you're trying to break a habit of laziness or apathy or worry or negativity, skepticism, cynicism, you know, when you get into one of those things, you know, where it's like all you see is problems and all you see is things that bug you and the, the voice in the head is not a good one. But then we put on a happy face and come and praise Jesus, you know, but all of us have our funky little weird worlds. And so all of us have some rewiring to do. It's a lifelong process. So, you know, don't be discouraged, man. If, if we're going into our third week and you hadn't done one, that's OK. Jump in, man. It's not too late. Go ahead. If you haven't got the book, get it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It, it ain't hard. And so go ahead and just um, embrace it. If today's your first day, awesome. If you're doing great, go to the next level. If you're doing it but stumbling, of course you are. Uncle G's holding on to old habits that don't serve you. Um, so anyway, that's kind of like that. We're going to look at the, the questions of Jesus each week. Last week it was, do you want to get well? That's a great question. Don't say it too quick because wellness carries responsibility, you know? So if I want a great marriage, but I'm not willing to, to really change as a husband, then maybe it's not really a desire. It's just kind of like you're supposed to, or you want it easy. And man, these things don't come easy. You know, if you're trying to win the respect of your kids or be a, a great friend to people or overcome an addiction or whatever it is, be careful. Because the guy at that pool, he said, yeah, man, I mean, I, he didn't say he wanted to get well. Jesus said, you want to get well? Excuses, complaining, blaming. And Jesus healed him anyway. And then he went, he took that blessing to a place he wasn't supposed to go and started doing. We don't know what it was, but Jesus found him and said, man, you better straighten up or it's going to get worse for you. And see, that's what he's trying to do is protect us. So do you want to get well? Yes. Are you willing to pay the price? If it's physically, financially, your fitness, your family, your faith, whatever it is, are you willing to get your hands dirty? You know, roll up your sleeves and get into the battle. You know, really action, not just saying it. You know, we've done enough of that. I can't speak for you, but I did enough of that. So do you want to get well? If the answer is yes, then buckle your seatbelt. And then the second question, you know, Jesus he, and it's in your book, and for to get to the lesson, I'm just going to refer to it, but it's right there in the book, is Jesus is going along, and then all of a sudden, you know, he, he hears a man, and he's crying out, and he's saying, Jesus, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, and they're probably trying to quiet him down and tell him, man, don't bother the teacher, and he's like, no, I mean, this is my shot. He had heard about Jesus, but one thing he was limited, he couldn't see. And he wasn't able to see him. And all he could do was hear and smell and taste and feel. And he couldn't see Jesus, but he had heard about him enough to know that this is my shot. And so as he's coming through, imagine the crowds. And all of a sudden, there's one voice that's yelling out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus is always drawn to the one that needs him. You think about it. He he was surrounded, a rock star, crowds all around him pressing upon, and he noticed the one frail woman. If you feel like you're not important to him, not important to the church, you feel like, man, if I wasn't around, it wouldn't be any different. You know, he, he don't see me. If you feel like that, man, you are the star of Jesus' show. You show me a time he didn't go into a town and, and didn't wasn't drawn to the least of these. And those were in need and those that needed him and wanted him. He never turned anybody down. He went where he was invited and he asked questions, but then he just blessed. He loved with no agenda. Man, that's a powerful thing. Love with no agenda. Jesus didn't have strings attached. Every now and then he said, follow me. And he moved on. But it wasn't like, hey, follow me so that I can do this and this and this and this. He's like, no, I'm going to love you where you are. And one person at a time, his love transformed them or showed them exactly where they were. You love him or you hate him. And so Jesus is going along. All of a sudden, he hears the voice. He's drawn to it. He goes. 
And the blind man, he says, have mercy on me. And Jesus asked the question. He said, what would you like for me to do for you? Jesus already knew what his need was. You know, he's asking questions he knows the answer to. But he wanted to find out if this man who wanted to see understood his one thing. And see, in this man's world, it was his sight. He wanted his sight. And he knew that was his one thing. But if Jesus comes to you and imagine the scene and he looks at you and said, what is it you want me to do for you? And he's locked in, just you and him. Do you have an answer? Do you know what your one thing, my one thing was at the time, man, you got to help me get over this drinking thing because it was about to kill me. You know, I was going to be a just another, man, did you hear what happened to Kit? I was on that road, dangerous, dark road. And what do you want me to do for you? The first was, man, set me free of this addiction to alcohol. You got to know what your one thing is. What is it? Is it a habit? Is it a character defect? Is it sinful nature that just has you gripped? Is it something from the past you can't let go of? Is it unforgiveness? You can't forgive yourself. You can't forgive your enemy. You know, is it a physical thing? Is it a financial thing? Man, it ain't that. It's a heart thing. But what is your one thing? Well, this blind man, Barnabas, he, he knew. You know, blind Barnabas, man, he's, he's like famous. And he said, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, I want to see. That's all he said. And Jesus said, boom, according to your faith, will it be done to you? Just like that. And immediately he could see. See, this 40 days is about the scales falling from our eyes so that we can see God. You know, it's like um, Elisha and Gehazi, you know, his, his servant and Elisha, and you're going to see this in one of your dailies, he said, open his eyes so he can see. And God opened his eyes and he saw chariots of fire that surrounded the enemies of God. And he realized, man, we got this. <clears throat> Sometimes, most times, it's just that we can't see anymore. We've been trapped in a box for so long, we can't see him. And we're saying over 40 days, Lord, help me see you. I want to feel you. I want to experience you. And I want to taste it. I want, I want the Holy Spirit to be real to me. Show me yourself. Give me a sign. Man, when you get that kind of hunger, Jesus always comes your way. You just got to know what you need. So let's be honest with ourselves. What is it you want him to do for you? And then I want you to boldly write it out. You don't have to let anybody see it. It can be yours and his, but please let him know, this is what I need you to do for me. Because if you do this, man then everything is going to, to open for me. You know, it's that thing that's been dogging you for years and years and years. It's time. This 40 days, is, it's time to face that. And it's time to bring it in front of Jesus and say, okay, you've got all the authority. Please, please, please change this thing. And then you've got to trust the way he's going to do it. All right. So do you want to get well? Yes, sir, I do. Okay, be prepared. What is it you want to do for me? I mean, want me to do for you? And then you tell him and then get ready. But this is where it gets really cool. You got to go outside of your prayer closet, outside of the house, outside of the church and pay attention and look for the way God is going to answer that prayer because every answer is yes in Christ Jesus. It's not that he says no. He always says yes, but then does it the way that you need it. And if it's something you don't need, he replaces it with what you should have prayed for. Or, you know, if you pray, give me courage. And then all of a sudden you're in a terrifying situation and you're surprised. It's like, how else are you going to get courage unless God puts you in a scary situation, man? That was one of the biggest things in my life is I was gripped with fear. I mean, I'd lost my calling, my family, my reputation, my everything. And still have my beautiful kids, still have my mama. <laughs> and otherwise, man, I, I had just squandered it all away. And I knew, I knew what I was supposed to do and where I was supposed to be. And I just prayed, God, show me the way. And then I started paying attention. It didn't come in the way that I thought it was going to come. It came through pain. It came through suffering. And I don't compare anybody's suffering. Some of y'all out there is like, yeah, trade your problems with mine in a second. Definitely with my prison ministry. I say that today to these guys. Please, I'm going to be open my life. But I realize you would love my problems. <laughs> but pain is pain. And pain is a great teacher and suffering will lead you. So I say, don't waste your pain. 
But don't be surprised if the greatest battles and victories of your life are going to come through pain. So don't curse God when he sends you what you're asking for. You know, trust him. So what do you want him to do for you? Write it down and look at it every day. And then be willing to get a broken heart. <laughs> he understands. You know what I'm saying? Pain ain't so bad. The worst fears, sometimes they're not what you think they could be. Which step are you struggling the most with? You know, which one is it out of the seven? And I want you to look at that or all of them, you know, whatever it is. If you're not even doing the daily, you're just kind of reading the quiet time and kind of doing the thing, but you're not journaling or you're not hitting your knees or you're not making measurable moves or you're not journaling about what you see. And no judgment, no shame, no criticism from me. I want you to ask yourself one simple question. Just say, why? You know, why not? <laughs> why am I not doing this? It's like, this doesn't take long. This is 40 days in a row. It's focused. And you're just praying for God to remove the scales. That's it. This is an eyesight thing. And why were so many miracles that Jesus did tied to blindness? I mean, it's probably the most fundamental thing that he can do for us that's the most dramatic change, even more than giving the speech back or giving the hearing back. You know, it's like, whoa, change the way you see things, change the way you look at things, the things you look at change every single time. Okay, so the scripture we're going to look at today is, you're like, I thought we were already doing it. <laughs> that was all intro, but I promise you this ain't going to be too terribly long. This is in 1 Corinthians 9. It's become one of the great passages of my life. You know from my last couple of talks that Paul has, besides Jesus, Paul has had the most fundamental impact on my life. And third, besides family, is, is Martin Luther King Jr. Period. You know, it's the way it is. And Paul has impacted me so much in the way that he carried on and blazed a trail, even though he was opposed and he wasn't understood and he was in trouble by his own people. And nobody understood Paul. And he went through pain and suffering and loneliness. And he kept on charging toward his dream all the way to where they had to chop his head off to shut him up. And he still converted some dang guards <laughs> while he was there. The dude told his story everywhere he went. He was the worst of the worst, the least of the least, not even deserved to be called an apostle, the least of God's people, you know, and then he says, I'm the worst of sinners, just like, man, he became more and more humble, this man that had so much to rely on himself about, and he just, God showed him the power and weakness and how much he would suffer for the name of Jesus. You know, that was his ministry, and you're going to suffer, Paul, but you're going to tell the whole world who you are, and it's going to save many, many people. And then you'll be with me in paradise. And so here in 1 Corinthians 9, here's what he says in verse 19. Though I am free and belong to no one, I've made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak. To win the weak, I've become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Man, there's so this is so rich. He says, man, I'm free, but I make myself a slave to other people. Man, I take, I submit to the lower position. I put others above myself. I respect people and treat them, you know, not as I think they deserve, but as Jesus would do it. I become a slave, become a servant, into the line, take the back seat. And God says, the servant is the greatest of these. And you'll be moved up to the front in humility. So he says he made himself a slave. And then he says, basically, the way that I put it is he became the other. He didn't just try to love the other, you know, or try to feel the other or try to convert, save the other. No, he became the other. And I had never seen that before. He says to those under the law, you know, I was that. To those not under the law, I did that too. To the Jews, became like the Jew. To the Gentile, became like the Gentile. To the Greek, I became the Greek. 
if there were Muslims at the time, which wasn't even around for another 500 years, um, he just said to the, to the Muslim, I became the Muslim to win the Muslim. See, these are the things that changed my life. Become the other. It's not just compassion. It's not just empathy. It's man, I'm going to put myself in your shoes, feel your pain, try to seek first to understand you. I'm going to find common ground with you. I'm going to walk a mile with you before I judge you. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to speak compassionately to you. When I'm wrong, I'm going to make it right with you. And I'm going to treat you with respect no matter how you treat me. I'm going to become you so that I can understand you. And then who knows? Maybe I can win you. There's so many times that I tried to convert someone instead of becoming them. I was the teacher to show them how they needed to be instead of crawling into their shoes and saying, help me feel what you feel. God gave me great opportunities. He says all things to all men. I became all things to all men. Today in our country, we're politically divided. We're racially divided. We're religiously divided. We're divided on gender. We're, man, people are dug in. So many people of faith are dug in on these issues, which are very important issues. But I'll tell you the secret You know, I can bring Crips and Bloods together in prisons easier than I can bring Democrats and Republicans. I I mean that for real, for real. If you put me in a prison, I'll bring some prison gangs together. We'll do some good. I promise you that. I mean, it's I I got no doubt. I've seen it too many times. Man, bringing, you know, Crips and Bloods, red and blue. Well, politically, bringing red and blue together, it's very, very hard. But the answer is you've got to become the other. To the Republican, I became the Republican. To understand the Republican. To the Democrat, I became the Democrat. To win. The Democrat's heart. Not to convince you to be like me, believe like me, think like me, vote like me. Man, that's up to you. I respect where you're coming from, but I want to feel you. And that's one of the reasons I work with Democrats on the left that embrace my work. I was raised on the right. (laughs) <laughs> that's that's fam and everywhere I come from people look like me believe like me you know so that that was easy I can become the 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 conservative because that's how parents raised me but when I started becoming the liberal becoming the democrat you know it changed me because I started to see things differently and now you know I mean I got I got I'm cool with both sides and I'm that's a blessing that God lets me to do that I traveled the world to try to understand the other. And really it was a journey to find myself. I mean, I was trying to figure out who am I because my whole identity was my reputation with y'all, my position with y'all, your opinion of me, the degree that hung on the wall, you know, the, the title that was given me, you know, what, what, what are you? Are you an evangelist? <laughs> you know, I was chasing that thing. And then it was like, man, I'm a zone leader. I'm a sector leader. I'm a region leader. I'm a super region leader. I'm a leader leader. <laughs> you know, it's just like, what's the next step? Like Paul, very ambitious and very, I can rely on me. See, but inside I lost myself because what happens when you, your identity is wrapped up in all those things and they go away. I'm a husband and then I'm not. You know, I'm a preacher and then I'm not, you know, I I live in that house, drive that car until I don't, you know, I've got this congregation, not anymore. And so all of a sudden I was like, if I'm not all that, then who am I? So I went back to the dude that I was before God got a hold of me and I became him for a while. And I was dangerous, crashing cars, you know, I was, I was a, I was a wreck heading for a bad destination. And then God, once again, he rescued me. Man, I told you last time, I tried to get away from him. He wouldn't let me go. Man, if we let people go so easy, I can't speak for you. A lot of times I let people go so easy, man, they're not open, you know, or they they fell away or, you know, whatever. And I just let them go. And Jesus never let me go ever. And I was offensive. I mean, I was, I treated him horribly. And I even told him and he would not let me go. He just kept coming and kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. And that is the prodigal father, you know, chasing the son. That changed my life. The divine stalker, (laughs) he won (laughs) because I couldn't get away. He's too fast, too strong. 
And two, he persevered with me. He was tenacious with me. Just like he, he spoke my language until I understood it, you know? And then the Holy Spirit did what he does, man. Good Lord. So when I was a teenager, um, I, I learned this art to become what you wanted me to be. You know, I was, I was, you know, scared kid, insecure kid, bullied kid. And then I became a bully. I mean, it was like, I mean, things were, I just became what I needed to be, to be accepted by you. To the jocks, I became a jock. To the religious folks, man, I was young life and FCA, which wasn't even real. You know, to the, to the wild dudes, drugging, drinking, man, I became that too. <laughs> you know, to the, the principal and coaches and everybody. I mean, I'm the athlete. And so, you know, 16, 17, 18 year old, I forgot who I was, man. Am I the wild man? <laughs> yeah. Am I a religious guy? Not really. Some people might think so. I wasn't at all. Am I the good kid that the, the principal and coaches think I am? Not at all. I mean, am I, am I the popular kid, man? Am I, who am I? I was putting on so many masks that one day you come home and you forget to take it off. And so, you know, this later in life, God was going to say, I'm going to teach you who you are, but you're going to have to go out and deal with some other people. And so even though it was a bad thing when I was a teenager, when I was learning to be who you wanted me to be, needed me to be, I was practicing for later in life. Don't waste your past. Don't waste the things that made you who you are. I mean, those are, that's the good stuff. Even if the devil was using it for a minute, oh man, God will use it. He used my addictive nature because I care deeply about things that I love hard. And what I like, I get hooked on. It makes me feel good. He used all that. Now it's my greatest strength. You know, it's my passion. It's my goal. It's, it's hard to stop me. Same way that I was going after the world. You feel what I'm saying? And so he'll use it. Whatever you give him, he will use. Paul became the other. And I decided I was going to try to do that. And so... Man, I went to some amazing places and saw some amazing people. I traveled through India and went to a monkey temple and rode elephants and went into a priest, I mean, a cave of the priest. I mean, just the land of Gandhi, man. I traveled through South Africa more than once. And I went into, you know, a prison and, and worked with Zulu warriors. And we danced and we sang. And, and man, the, the South Africa just captured my heart. And we went through the, the deep, deep darkness in the Honduras and Guatemala are amazing places. Guatemala on the pyramids, you know, deep into the heart of Honduran prisons. And I saw some real darkness and it changed me as I tried to become them, feel them. Man, Tijuana, Mexico became, they embraced me. I mean, I was there 40 times in, I don't know, a little over a year. I mean, I just, I don't do anything a little bit. You know, but I, I, I now understand I was embraced by the Latino culture. And there's so many things that I learned and that I wish we could learn from that beautiful culture, their hospitality, the way they celebrate their family. They invited me in and I'm a made man there. <laughs> they protected me. Man, one of the greatest blessings of my life has been, you know, to be embraced by the African-American culture. I've gotten to lead churches that not a lot of people look like me. It was the blessing of my life as I was embraced by those that don't look like me. You know, can you become the other besides just having a couple of people of color as your friends? And what if you go to a block party and you see the beauty or a family reunion, all the things I wish that, that I had culturally, you know, I mean, this rich culture of family. You know, and just, a, oh, man, those are some of the best memories of my life is being able to be in people's homes and to feel them, become them. And I envy so many things in the cultures that, that are not like mine. I mean, in many ways, the American story is, you know, we're young in the world's landscape and history. We're kind of like, you know, teenage punks that have more money than anybody else does. And I say that I love my country. Don't get me twisted. But what I'm saying is, if you only ever see things through your eyeballs and you hang with people that look like you, think like you, believe like you, vote like you, then you're going to miss out on almost everything that life has to offer, you know? And so this crazy travel as I went around Ukraine, you know, that was crazy, a Soviet prison, you know, and getting to see, I got, I got to preach in, they're called conservative Baptist churches in the Ukraine. And I did several of them. 
and they look like the cathedrals. They, they look like they would be Orthodox cathedrals or Catholic cathedrals, and they have the style of the the Russian, you know, um, architecture. And uh, you wouldn't have known there were Baptist churches, man. It was like men in the front, ladies in the back, head covering for the ladies. I mean, it was serious as our get out. And then they did introduce me. And I'm I'm everything they don't like. <laughs> I'm tall, loud, American. I had long hair at the time. I'm covered with ink. See, over there, if you got tattoos, you've been in prison. And those those tattoos, they speak to what you're in there for. And so I'm walking down the street looking like me. And <laughs> I was everything they didn't like. And now I'm up in front of a church and I got to try to win them over. Here's what I figured out. All those years when I was working for the church, Man, I preached to y'all. Y'all were the easiest group to preach to, man. You laughed at all my jokes and you clapped and applauded and told me I did great even when I didn't do good. And you were so easy to preach. I didn't become a very, very, you know, uh, an effective speaker until I got out there and started preaching to the world. See, I preach to the world full time now. On Tuesday, I was doing a corporate gig. Man, you could preach without even having to say his name. And then, you know, that was Tuesday. Then Wednesday, I was in a juvenile prison. And I got to preach again and just some beautiful boys. I get to see them every week. Toughest juvenile prison in the state. Today, I was in I was in uh, two auditoriums at a high school speaking to all the ninth graders and then all the 10th graders. And you could preach at a school. You don't got to say his name. Man, people should know you. And so it was, ah, it was the journey of my life. I'll never try. And it ain't, they finished yet, is to become the other. I mean, it it changed me forever. And so, you know, who are you hung up on, man? What issue? If it's not politically, you know, what about gender issues? Can you become the other? Oh, man, I've experienced that up close and personal. Now, I'm, you know, this I'm, I'm talking just as real as I can be to you. To the transgender, I became the transgender to try to understand and feel a story that's not like mine, you know? You, you understand what I'm saying? I worked with, I've done a lot of work with Aryan Brotherhood, which are skinhead Nazis. And I mean, to the, the racist, man, I, this was hard. I had to become that. Now, not act like that, but feel that and try to win them. And some of them became heroes and started loving their brothers of color. I mean, I've seen it. I've seen radical changes. So, I mean, what is it for you? Is it a religious thing? Man, these Muslims. Well, have you ever gone to a mosque? Have you ever worshipped? I've been into. I've been invited into Juma services, which is the day of prayer, holy day of prayer in prisons. And I, as a Christian, was invited in. I couldn't participate, but I got to witness it, and that was a high, you know, highest respect. Um, when you have to win over the world, <laughs> a bunch of gangsters or a bunch of Ukrainian people that are looking at you like you're. <laughs> Now you figure out if you can engage and communicate. God was doing his work, you know, to the addict. I definitely became an addict. You know, Paul says to the weak, I became weak. For so many years, I felt like I had to be strong and I can't be weak. And then to the weak, man, how are you going to win the weak? Strong scares the weak. Those that are struggling with addiction, mental health, whatever it is, man, they need someone to sit with them and feel them. They don't need to be fixed. I'll tell you that from experience, man, as a guy that was drowning and the phone was not ringing anymore and all my ride or dies wouldn't have anything to do with me. Man, then you figure out who you are and what you need is someone just to come and sit with you. I didn't need to be fixed. I didn't need to be discipled. Didn't need to be trained. Didn't need to study again. Need to be this. I just needed someone to come and see me. That's what we need. People who have left, that's what they need. They need you to go and sit with them. No agenda. I just want to be with you, bro. You know, we just sit. We just hang out. We just talk. I got no agenda. None. Just to love you. Man, that changed my life. So I'm going to close with a story. I was on death row in Louisiana at a prison called Angola. The biggest prison in the country. 6,200 men on 18,000 acres in rural Louisiana. Angola is known as the bloodiest prison in the world for decades. And I got to go there and do work with a bunch of those men several times and uh, go to the prison rodeo, which is a whole nother story. But I was doing death row work 
and we were going from cell to cell. And I was there with a lot of Christian volunteers that I didn't know. And so I'm with them. And so as we're going cell to cell, some of them were reading scriptures to the brothers behind the wire. And which is fine. Hey, I mean, anybody that serves and goes behind the wire to help. I mean, I got mad respect. But there were many of those brothers that didn't ask for it. And they didn't even know, you know, we didn't even know who they were. And they, there was no real engagement. So at Angola, you know, these, these inmates, um, some of them were eager for human contact. Others laid with their backs, you know, to the front, just their head to the wall, didn't want to be bothered. But there was a lot of them that just looked to see why you were there, what was up. And so there was one, they were reading the Bible, you know, to this guy. And he wasn't responding and they moved on. And I walked up and I was just like, he looked at me like I was another one. And I had to find a connecting point. And <laughs> so I hope I don't offend anybody with this. But I looked up on his wall and there's this picture of Kim Kardashian. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, this is his prized possession. And she wasn't, you know, she was all her glory. And so I looked up and I looked at him. I said, hey, man, I got some bad news for you. <laughs> and he looked at me like, what? And I said, Kim doesn't look like that anymore. And he's like, what are you talking about? And I said, well, she happens to be, you know, she's with child. And like most women, you know, she's she's gained some weight during the pregnancy. She don't look like that. And his face fell. He was like, oh. <laughs> and then he looked at me and he goes, she's still bad though, ain't she? And I said, oh yeah. You know, so we're laughing. He gets off off his rack. He comes over and I put my hand through the bars and he embraces my hand. The human contact is powerful. And right away, like happened so many times, out of all these 80-something tattoos that create a story that goes all the way up, he found himself in it. And it was the Arabic word that means peace. It's called salam. And he said, why you got that? And I said, because I come in peace. And he's like, hmm. And see, nobody had noticed his Quran that was sitting right there. And they were just reading scriptures to him. And I looked down and I said, Assalamu alaikum, brother. And he said, Hmm, alaikum <laughs> And we greeted one another in his voice, you know, I mean, speaking his language, becoming him. He's a brother of more color than me, about half my age. He's on death row waiting for a call. He hopes he never comes. And here we are. This is our moment. And so now we've connected. And he asked a super important question. He said, why are you here? And I was like, mm, probably because if I was on the other side of these bars and you were out here, I would want you to come and see me. And he said, yeah, but why are you here? And I said, I want to tell you, I love you. And he goes, you love me. And I said, yeah. And he said, okay, then your book says, and he's getting ready to quote the Bible to me. Don't think that, I mean, just don't, you can't judge. You don't know who you're talking to sometimes. And he goes, your book says that if you love me, then you should be willing to die for me, right? I said, yes, sir. He goes, are you willing to die for me, brother? Whew. That hit me. <laughs> and I said, um, I don't know, bro. I said, I don't know if I'm that good a man. You know, and he goes, honesty, <laughs> that's what's up. And he smiled and he came over and as much as we could, kind of did the gangster hug through the bars, you know. And he said, uh, will you come back and see me? And I said, I'll try. I don't know if and when I'll be back, but I'll never forget you. And we had this beautiful human connection that started with Kim Kardashian. <laughs> and then it went to a tattoo. And then it went to his Quran. And then it went to a beautiful question. Then it went to an honest answer. And... There was no agenda. I mean, I didn't have it. I, did I convert him? I mean, no, I just loved the dude. I became the other. And so I'll leave you with this. We got so many beautiful brothers and sisters out there with different journeys. Some of you have been through divorce. Me too. Some of y'all have been through addiction. Me too. Some of y'all have been through bankruptcy. Me too. Some of y'all have been through arrests. Me too. Some of y'all have been through abuse. Me too. Some of y'all been through some mental illness. Me too. Some of y'all been through some hell. Me too. I want to tell you, I see you. And if I get the chance, I want to become you, walk with you, feel you. 
And this is what we teach the brothers. And just this morning, speaking at that school, I see you, I feel you, I got you. That works with brothers, that works with family, that works with church brothers and sisters, that works with kin, it works for strangers. It's like, I see you means respect. I respect you without you doing anything. I'm going to treat you with respect. I feel you means compassion, man. I feel you. At least I want to. Let me walk with you and I will feel you. I don't care where you lean politically or gender or racially or religiously. Let me walk with you. I ain't going to judge you. I'm going to feel you. And then lastly, I see you. That means loyalty. I mean, excuse me. I got you. It's I see you. I feel you. I got you. I got you as I got you back, bro. Forever and ever and ever. And see, if somebody leaves the church, does that mean you ain't got them no more? You know? If somebody doesn't behave the way you want, does that mean I ain't got you? No, no, loyalty is loyalty. I learned these things in a prison. Respect, I learned in prison, not in the seminary. Compassion, I learned behind that wire, not in the fellowship. Loyalty, shoot, I learned that in the toughest prisons in the world, not in my Christian walk. I learned from the hated, feared, and forgotten, and they saved my life, and they taught me lessons I could only learn on those streets. So I leave you with this. Do you want to get well? What do you want him to do for you? What's the one thing that would change everything? And then in your relationships, please become the other. It'll set you free. and You won't even have to preach about Jesus. People will come to you because they will see him in you. And that's what I want. I love you. Keep rolling. I won't come and see you. And let's just do this. Jump on board. Let's do this. It's a prayer revival. It's spreading. Thank you, Dallas. You're going to change. You're changing my life. I'm going to become better. And what I do because of you. Peace out. I'll see you next week.